All right. Thank you so much for being here uh, on this second Sunday Dharma series conversation that we're having with Shyla Catherine. Really happy to have her here. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, just letting you know that this second Sunday Dharma series is something that we do on the second Sunday of every month, uh, where we invite uh, almost always a Dharma teacher. Sometimes there's a few exceptions to come and talk to us about what's either alive in their practice or talk to us about a book that they've written. Um, and we offer these by donation. We're so grateful for any contributions that you're able to make uh, to the second Sunday Dharma series. They do help to support all of the programming at IMCW. Um, so just to um, let you know, next month in February, Sharon Salzberg will be joining us on February 12th, and that, uh, that will be up for registration very soon. Um, all right, so I'm Trisha Stotler, and I am one of the teachers at IMCW, also the director of programs. I'm typically the host for this second Sunday Dharma series, but not always, but I'm always happy to be here and talk to our authors. Um, I want to thank our ASL interpreters, Kathrell and Sasha, so much for um for their help this morning. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, before we get started in this conversation uh, with Catherine, just to let you know that your questions um, are an important part of these sessions. And so if you have them, as uh, as we're speaking, please send them to the in the chat to, I believe it says, ask questions here. Yes, it does with the image of the bowl. And those questions will get funneled to me um, and we'll get to as many as we can um, toward the end of the session. So Shyla, <clears throat> really happy to have you here with us to talk about, mostly talk about your book, Beyond Distraction. It was very dog-eared, and I've got a couple notes here for you. But if you don't know Shyla, your Shyla, your um, your bio is really packed. And so I was thinking how to distill this. Um, the author of three books, Focused and Fearless, Wisdom Wide and Deep, and this one we're talking about today, Beyond Distraction. You've been a meditator since the 80s, right? Long, long time. I'm um, studied in with the Western teachers as well as in Asia. Um, I think the thing that I really had to reread a couple of times is that you've spent a total of nine years cumulatively on retreat. So your practice is, uh, yeah, very, very precious. Uh, and that you talk and teach and write on this topic of concentration and jhanas quite a bit, the meditative absorptions. Um, and I've read some of your other books as well. And I really loved that the Beyond Distraction, Five Practical Ways to Focus the Mind, was really accessible for just about all levels, even experienced meditators kind of coming back to these teachings. So, um, yeah, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about um, why you wrote this book at this time. And then we've kind of got some questions. I know you might like to guide us through some meditation. But yeah, welcome. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the topic of um, Beyond Distraction. And at um, as you said, I'm I, I'm glad you recognize that the book is um, is accessible to all levels of practitioner because I felt like it addressed a topic that was important to all levels of practitioner, and I wanted to work with dis distracting thoughts at initially because they were a distraction to concentration in order to establish deep concentration, in order to attain samadhi or to prepare the mind for the deep absorption states, states of jhana, one has to be able to let go of thoughts. Um, you know, thoughts just don't permeate the states of absorption. So one must be able to let go of the thought 
and still and quiet and settle the mind. And so the hindrance of restlessness becomes one of the primary hindrances that people work with. But then also after doing jhana practice, it's so interesting to look at the mind. You know, once one concentrates the mind, it's not that one abides for the whole rest of one's life in a thought-free state. We need to think, and we need to think intelligently. We need to think effectively. We need to be able to use our mind. And it's not uncommon to recognize after we've done some mindfulness practice, some concentration practice, and then we look more deeply at the mind and realize, you know, there are some habits there that are really not helping. And so uh, the Buddha gave us strategies for working with habitual tendencies of mind that are not helping our path. So um, I, I liked the systematic nature of these teachings. Um, I, they, they can't come directly from the suttas. They come from the middle link discourses of the Buddha. Two discourses, sutta number 19 and 20, for those of you that like to um, go for the primary sources. And the, and the Buddha gave very particular instructions on how to recognize a thought, what to look for in the thought, and which ones to deal with in what kind of a way. And then to give specific five steps that one goes through in a sequence. First, try this. If it doesn't work, then try that. And if it doesn't work, then try that. And if it doesn't work, going through five steps. And I found that those five steps are tremendously effective. Um, every once in a while, I'll be sitting in a retreat, for example. And, you know, things will be getting pretty calm and quiet, but there'll be one or two thoughts thought topics or thought patterns or uh, uh, thoughts that link up to a particular set of emotions, some kind of repeating scenario that that persists as a distraction um, even after most of the mind has settled. And I found that when I apply these five strategies, they work. I mean, I've never had them not work. <laughs> So um, I, I, I've often used them, you know, after there's a general settling in a retreat, but then there's a few, like two, or maybe three kind of scenarios that the mind just kind of keeps coming back to. Oh, it keeps planning that thing I have to do when I get out of the retreat, or it keeps going to that event and ruminating on that one that happened. And, and I, when I work with the strategies, usually whatever the stuck point was is 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 loosened up and cleared out, and then the thoughts can fall away. So I found them to be tremendously useful, and I appreciate having a, a five-step process. Many of the thoughts are dealt with with the first or the second step. It's not like you have to go through all five every time. But the Buddha did offer us these very specific techniques and, and approaches and methods to use. So I say he, he offered them to us. Why don't we dry them out? <laughs> so let's use them. And then when I started teaching them, sometimes I taught them in courses or, or just kind of tossed them in, in sort of like all five in one Dharma talk. But it's pretty hard to really work a system when you just get an overview in one Dharma talk. And I had the opportunity to teach a few, several years ago. I taught a retreat that was, I think it was 12 days or around it. Around 12 days, I think, of a silent retreat focused on these strategies. Mm -hmm. And when we practiced them, I got to see that not only did they really deepen people's samadhi and concentration because they cleared away the, 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 the obstacles, the mental obstacles, but they also led to tremendously profound insights into emptiness and anatta. People were having deep experiences of anatta, even though I was not suggesting that they contemplate anatta, not self. Why? Because so many of so many thoughts are really about ourselves. So many of our persistent strategies are serving the purpose of reaffirming our self-view and putting us in that same kind of self-perspective, that one kind of a, a groove. And when we work with the thoughts and free ourselves from those the, those stuck places, uh, we experience tremendous spaciousness of mind, 
And we very often see how a sense of self, how our identity is formed through the very way we think. And we have the possibility of freeing the mind at a very deep level. So not only do does working with these, not only does this approach to working with thoughts deepen our concentration, but I think it's tremendously valuable for profound and liberating insight practice. Mm-hmm. So I became very, even more excited about working with thoughts, put together an online course and, and, and kept teaching it. And it's, it remained interesting to me, mm-hmm. even after teaching it for quite a long time. And so I put together a book based on it and it still remained interesting to me. So I I welcome opportunities just like you've given me this morning to be able to share it with you because, you know, the mind is fascinating. And um, that's really where most of our our, our, uh, obstacles lie. (laughs) Sure, there are sometimes life challenges that seem more external to us, but how we think about them, how we work with them, what happens when we sit down with our eyes closed in our own minds, our thoughts, you know, that that's where we have the potential to learn and build our skills and deepen our understanding and really free the mind from those patterns. Yeah. yeah. So I don't want to get too heady about it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we could do a little guided a guided meditation to settle a little bit and I give you a little taste of it. Great. Thank you. That'd be great. So please find a way of, of sitting where you're you know, upright and relaxed. You don't have to go to your Zafu and cross your legs. You're welcome to if you like, but uh, but just settle a little bit. Drop your attention into the body. Feel the body sitting and breathing. And very often when I intend to work with thoughts, I first give myself the alternative object of sitting and breathing, or something very tangible. If we jump right into thoughts too quickly as our object, we might get seduced into their content. So take a few moments to just settle the attention, feel the body sitting, breathing. Have the intention to let go of judgments, to let go of interpretations, to let go of the thoughts about experience and simply be mindful of this present encounter with experience. And though the attention might be to be aware of sitting and breathing, did you find that your mind started thinking? Did it drift off into a reflection from something that happened yesterday or a plan of what's going to happen next or some kind of interpretation or judgment about something that's happening now, some view, some opinion? It's not wrong to have the have thoughts arise. The minds think. But we might want to um, have a, a little more influence over what kinds of thoughts our minds think and when and how thoughts predominate.
The first and most important approach to thoughts is probably something that you've all been doing, that you learned in your initial um, mindfulness courses. And that's to recognize that when thinking is happening, thinking is happening. A thought is a thought. So we let go of the story and the content that the thought is about. We're not entangled in the story of what happened way back when, but we're aware that what's happening is present thinking right now. And mindfulness like this actually resolves the vast majority of our thoughts. Relatively few thoughts repeat and persist in need further strategies. So don't underestimate the power of those instructions you probably heard on your very first introduction to mindfulness class to ground the attention in the body. And when thinking arises, to know, to notice, to be aware that thinking is happening. And then redirect your attention back to sitting and breathing or whatever is predominant in the present moment. As we become mindful of thoughts arising, the Buddha suggested in the Middle Link Discourses Sutta number 19 to notice if they fall into a class of thoughts that we would call unwholesome. You know, thoughts of greed and lust, thoughts of hatred and anger, jealousy and envy, thoughts of conceit and arrogance and, you know, cruelty, you know, those nasty thoughts. <laughs> Or if those thoughts are wholesome, thoughts of kindness and generosity, thoughts of compassion or wisdom, or simply the clear thought that you know it arises very often in mindfulness practice, where we recognize this is impermanent, this is a thought. There's nothing to fear from those wholesome thoughts. But those unwholesome ones really can get us into trouble. The Pali languages kusala and akusala, often translated as wholesome and unwholesome. Uh, we might think of them as useful or not useful, harmful or not harmful, beneficial or unbeneficial. And it does seem to be important to bring that basic wisdom to the experience of thought that when it arises, we know which group it would fall into. And sure, it might seem like there are many thoughts that are yeah, not terrible, maybe a little agitated, maybe a little restless, maybe preventing concentration, but not really evil. And so some people like to say that there's a neutral category. But the sutta says, just put them into two categories. Useful, not useful. Wholesome, unwholesome. And we continue to sit, aware of sitting and breathing. If another thought arises, notice it's a thought. Is it wholesome or unwholesome? And then drop it and come back to sitting and breathing. The understanding, the wisdom, the discernment that occurs simply from this exercise is very important. It's not about judging ourselves as being a good person or a bad person. It's bringing that, that wisdom that liberates 
to the experience of our own mental habits. And then should you find that some of those unwholesome ones keep repeating, you don't have to do much about the wholesome ones. You know, wholesome thoughts are wonderful, but we wouldn't indulge them if we were engaged in a mindfulness practice. We'd simply let them go and then just continue with our practice. But the unwholesome ones, ooh, sometimes they have a, a kind of a grip to them or it seems as though we get stuck in them. Sometimes the, 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 the groove in our minds, the tendency seems very deep and we just fall into them and don't even know that we're thinking those thoughts until five minutes later, we're really lost. So I think it's helpful to choose one or two or three patterns that you can recognize in yourself. They come up fairly frequently. Or they're particularly toxic and strong. So though they're not common, you still want to work with them whenever they arise. And those will be the ones that you would apply this systematic series of, of strategies for. So imagine you're just sitting and breathing and one of those thoughts arises. Maybe it's a thought of envy. You think about somebody who got something that you wanted and the mind just goes on, envious. They don't deserve it. I deserve it. I should have gotten recognized. They shouldn't have. Eh, you know, it goes on with its story. It builds up feelings of anger and, and, and thoughts of self and self-interest. So when that thought process arises, the first strategy, after recognizing this is thinking, letting it go and coming back a few times, but if it still keeps coming, then, then we might need to develop other skills around that thought to free the mind. And the first strategy is to replace it with an alternative. If it's a thought of anger, you might replace it with a thought of kindness. If it's a thought of lust, you might replace it with a thought of that produces some kind of equanimity. If it's a thought of doubt, you might replace it with the thought that it's okay or something of confidence that builds confidence. If it's a thought of envy, you might uh, bring in a thought of appreciation. Joy, rejoicing. So if an alternative thought comes to mind, just dwell with that alternative thought for a moment or two. It can dislodge the unwholesome thought. And remind you that you are not stuck in that pattern. And then settle again with sitting and breathing. Maybe that thought process arises again, that same old story or something similar. Sometimes it happens when we indulge it. And sometimes we indulge these thoughts because we really haven't considered where they're taking us. And so the second strategy is to examine the danger in those thoughts. In these discourses, the Buddha said, whatever one frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of one's mind. Is this the pattern that you want to become your inclination? 
consider where that pattern is taking you, what it is developing. And is it leading to the values and the qualities that you aspire for? Or is it obstructing your spiritual development? Unwholesome thoughts are usually obstructing our spiritual development. And so we are re reminded, you know, it's not some just innocuous thing arising in our mind. This is creating a pattern. And it can be very powerful to contemplate the danger. It can build the commitment to not want to keep fueling it. It can inspire us to really want to overcome that pattern. And we, of course, don't want to terrify ourselves thinking about it. We just contemplate the danger. We see the problem in it. And then often when we see that something is harmful, it just naturally we settle back. And get in touch again with sitting and breathing. And if those thoughts arise again, the Buddha said, try the next strategy. He says, ignore it. Forget it. It seems so simple. But in order to be able to give our attention to something skillfully, to be mindful of something, we must also have the capacity to turn our attention away. Wise attention is it describes this ability to give attention to something wisely, which also means not giving attention to something if our attention is going to be uh, is going to fuel the defilements. And sometimes we mean well; we're trying to be mindful of that thought, but nevertheless, we're sucked into it, <laughs> and we're caught up in the emotion or the drama. And then it's better to just step away a little bit, turn away in our minds and build the concentration with sitting and breathing as an object, for example. These first three strategies develop some abilities, uh, some skills, meditative skills to be flexible and uh, work with thoughts in a variety of ways. But it's the next strategy, the fourth strategy that gets to the root of the problem. It's described as stilling the thought formations of those thoughts, but it means looking deeply at what causes the arising of those thoughts. We're not so concerned at where they're going, but we're concerned at what's causing their arising, what's fueling them. And often we'll be looking then at kind of in a meditative investigation where we're looking at the relationship of thoughts and emotions, thoughts and feelings. A sensation arises, a reaction this way, and it triggers this kind of a pattern in, or response in our minds. And then it, it proliferates in this way or that way. Often it builds up a sense of who we are. And then more thoughts have to defend that sense of who we are. And so this meditative investigation looks deeper and deeper. What's underneath this pattern and what's sustaining that pattern? And where is this, this thought getting its fuel? 
What happened to trigger it? And we're learning. We're learning about the causes and conditions that sustain those unskillful or unhelpful thought patterns. When we're looking at causes and conditions, we're not identified with the story of self because we're seeing causes and conditions. So this gives us direct insight into the emptiness of thought, into the not self characteristic of mental experience. So then thoughts may arise, but they arise as utterly empty phenomena because we've seen their emptiness. We know they're not mine. They're not self. They're conditioned patterns. And very often this deep insight, this wisdom, frees our mind from so many unhelpful patterns in our lives. Most unskillful uh, patterns only thrive when their causes have not been seen. But when we meet them with wisdom, their power falls away. They dissolve. And the mind settles, sitting and breathing. But it sometimes happens that even though we have seen these thoughts clearly, we understand them very vividly. It's like there's a kind of a momentum, you know, a, a, maybe a, a karmic push from our past patterning. Something just, they keep coming, even though we know better, even though we've seen them, even though we understand them, even though we feel like we're not identified with them. Nevertheless, we sit down to meditate and that same old thought just comes again. Or we see something and we get triggered in the same way. This, this, this uh, practice doesn't only, only work, only happen in meditation. It works anytime we're, we're seeing the mind. And so the fifth and final strategy is to bring in strong resolve. To say a very strong no more, enough to our minds. And with that strength of determination, the energy for the thoughts is cut off. And they don't arise again. This can only happen if the strength of determination is based on the purity of the wisdom that sees causes and conditions. If we're still identified with the thoughts, then there's going to be aversion or anger in our no, in our enough. And that aversion and anger, that self-judgment is going to just fuel more thoughts. But it's very powerful when we can add determination and resolve to the purity of our wisdom. And then it can really cut through those thoughts at a very deep, deep level so that there's no more causes for them to arise. And the mind becomes clear open, mindful of whatever's occurring, sitting, breathing, sounds. If a thought arises, it arises simply as empty phenomena and just fades away, no proliferation, so no obstruction to concentration. And the mind becomes very still settled.
Thank you. So this kind of races you through these strategies. Um, and what I'd like to do is say a few more words about it and then welcome your questions on how you work with uh, distracting thoughts. And if any of you have already read the book, perhaps you have questions about anything that I've written in the book. I also include many different, um, you know, like exercise boxes where there are um, uh, things that you can do in daily life, not only in meditation, to try to work with the sort of point of the strategy to develop the skill or a reflection around it. Um, so the basic um, approach is to first bring mindfulness. It's a thought. And this helps us distinguish the process from the content. So we're aware and we're working with the process that's happening in our minds. It doesn't really matter what the story is. You know, it could be a story of, I don't know, I this happened last week or that's going to happen next week, whatever it might be. Those stories, they give us a little hint. They tell us something um, and it, it, it helps us figure out if it's wholesome or unwholesome, if it's beneficial or not beneficial. But for the most part, we want to recognize that a thought is a discrete mental event that's arising in the present moment. The story matters less. Now, there may be some, some thoughts, some content that we really need to reflect on. So I'm not completely dismissing the content of the mind, but for the most part, this approach deals with what's happening now. Oh, the mind is in it is caught in a in a in a pattern of thought that's linked to anger, or a pattern of thought that's linked to fear, or a pattern of thought that's linked to lust, or a pattern of thought that is perpetuating conceit and arrogance. So we're looking at those patterns for the most part. And so the particular events that happened are of, of much less significance and are not so much a part of the this this the Buddha's approach here. So we um so we we recognize it's a thought. And then we practice this uh, replacing, which might sound like, well, are we just gonna like now change our minds to some positive thinking? It's not about positive thinking so much. It's about developing flexibility. Because if you're able to to replace a, an unwholesome thought with a wholesome one, you know you're not stuck. And so many people think they're stuck in their patterns. If you can replace it even for a split second, even if your mind rebounds right back into that same pattern, even for that split second, you know you're not stuck. And you can then practice to expand your alternatives. Very often, our patterns keep repeating because we've never given our minds alternatives. That stimulus occurs. We think of that person. We see that experience. We hear that sound or we think that thought or we have this feeling and we go into the same pattern again and again and again and again. And we practice it a hundred times a day or a hundred times a week for years. So this first strategy expands our, our options, but it's pretty hard when you're sitting and meditating to think, oh, what else can I think about that's better than this? I, I really recommend that you have, you know, we all know our minds. If not, just sit and meditate generally a few times. And at the end, write down what your common patterns were. It'll only take you a couple of sessions and you'll realize, oh, yeah, I tend to go into worry about that or I tend to go into anger about that. And then when that form of thought or that pattern arises again, um, before that pattern arises again, outside of the meditation, write down three or four alternatives so that, you know, when they arise, let me try this one. I'll replace my mind with that with this one. Now, the, the, the classic suggestion is if you have a thought of anger, to shift to loving kindness. If you have a thought of lust, shift to something like the reflection on impermanence or the recognition that the that all, you know, that, you know, something like, oh, if you're attracted to somebody that in, it's not an appropriate relationship for your life or that time in your life or for whatever reason and you want to let go of that, that obsession then, um, then you know, you think of something like the 32 parts of the body or something that that neutralizes it. So those are kind of classic um, Buddhist uh, approaches, but you can develop any kind of alternative thoughts. You know, if you're feeling self-doubt, then just think, I, I, I can 
can trust myself to do this. I can do this. You know, I have the experience. I can do this. And you just sort of give yourself a pep talk, maybe, but not an elaborate big story. But the thoughts can be that simple. They don't have to be real classic things. Just give yourself a few alternatives so that you know you're not stuck in the pattern. And then when you reflect on the danger, it's really important that you not reflect on the danger before you know you have alternatives. Because if you start reflecting on the danger right away, before you've given yourself alternatives, it can get pretty scary. But if you know you have alternatives and you know you're not stuck, then reflecting on the danger creates less um, less energy for the danger, you know, that, 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 that unwholesome pattern and more motivation to go to something else. But there's an order to this. And it's not that every single time you sit down, you have to go through all five, but the skills that we develop in the first one, make the second one effective. And if you go to the second one, before you have the skills of the first one, there could be some problem. You know, you could scare yourself. You could get more depressed or feel despair because you don't feel like you have an alternative. So first develop the alternatives. Then recognize the, 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 the danger in, in pursuing, in continuing to put energy into the habit. Then the third, the third strategy be, being, oh, I wanted to share with you a little, the, the, the similes. The first strategy has a simile of a peg that you knock out a, a peg of wood by a peg is stuck in a block of wood. You can take a smaller peg and use the smaller peg to knock out the larger peg. It, it's a lovely image because that smaller peg doesn't get stuck. You use one thought to remove another one. And then the mind is free from both. It's not attached. Um, the, um, the, the, the third strategy is of ignoring it. And this simile is just simply closing your eyes. It's not like a big forceful thing, and it's not about burying something deep within. It's not denying something ever happened. It's just recognizing that we have the capacity to give our attention to something, and we also have our capacity to take our attention away from it. This is really important, you know, especially with traumatic events. Sure, we need to look at, at, at sometimes, we, sometimes we really need to look at the, the painful experiences that have occurred in our past, but maybe not every minute of every day. You know, sometimes we need to be able to turn away too. It's not the appropriate time or we don't have the appropriate resources. So that ability to turn towards skillfully depends upon our ability to turn away. And though some people practice um, when they approach mindfulness, think that mindfulness is always about going toward the Buddha taught wise attention, which includes being able to ignore something. It's very helpful in terms of working with grudges or times when we've been betrayed or when things are completely out of our control and they're past and there is absolutely nothing more that needs that could be done. Nothing that could be communicated, nothing that could change anything. And the only person that's suffering from this rumination is, you know, ourselves. And there comes a time sometimes when the best we can do is say, it's past. You know, it's over. And that's part of this same strategy. The forgetting it doesn't mean that we deny it. We must learn from it. And, and already the first couple of strategies have had us engage in some learning. But we also need to be able to sometimes just let it go and move on. And this is part of our, of our work with thoughts. So we shouldn't think that thoughts are just about staying with them. No, no. It's much more about a skillful understanding of the mind. And then the investigation piece is really interesting. It's one that Westerners really like. Um, and I think it's very powerful. But the problem is, is some people do it too much and they forget that they need the strategies before it to make it useful. So to be able to look very deeply and see things just as causes and conditions, we already have to have had the ability to look at and turn away. Because if we're seduced in the story in any way, we're not going to be able to see how so many of our patterns interact with a particular way that we conceive of self. So we're blending and interacting with our own conditioning, our 
personal conditioning and the impersonal processes of, of this construction of self. So we have the particular conditioning, the specific things that occur the, with the events of our lives, you know, our tendencies, what happens based upon, you know, our own conditioning. But we're also looking at the um, universal or general characteristics of emptiness, of anatta. So this, uh, this inv meditative investigation can go very deep where we might start simply with the thought. And then we ask ourselves, well, what's underneath that thought? And we realize there's an emotion. Maybe there's anger. Oh, well, and what's underneath that anger? Oh, there's there's some um, a sense of fear. And what's underneath that fear? Oh, some, some sense of shame. And then there's a story about the shame. And then it jumps to this. And then what's underneath that? Oh, there's some sense of... Of, uh, of not control and then there's a story but and then it comes back and we and we go through feeling and emotion feeling and emotion feeling and emotion very often getting deeper and deeper until we get to some very core sense of identity and we see how that identity is formed and understanding it as a concept, we realize we don't need to defend it we don't need to keep thinking about it we don't need to, because we've seen what it is. You know, the way we've seen how self is constructed and we see its emptiness, its conditioned nature. Mm -hmm. So that insight then allows us to bring in determination and strength for those few thoughts that uh, those few patterns that persist due to their kind of the, the momentum of their repetition. If we bring in that energy and effort too soon, and many beginning meditators think, I'm just going to bash away those thoughts, I'm going to just say no, then, um, then it's too strong and it's not based upon the wisdom. That kind of strength has to be brought in when there's absolutely no aversion or self-judgment in the mind. It's just seeing, you know, this is an unwholesome pattern and it's not what I want to cultivate in my life. You know, there's wisdom in that. And there can be certainty and there can be strength to say, no, I've seen what anger and hatred lead to, and I will not give one more minute of my life to it. And we say that with such absolute determination that we do not give one more minute of our life to it. We do not waste 60 seconds in anger for the rest of our lives. We have that ability and it's not repression and it's not denial, it, but it only can come when we can say it without any anger, when we can bring in that determination without the slightest anger towards self, it's just the wisdom fueled by our commitment and our energy and our determination. It's powerful. The image, the, the simile that the sutta uses is of a strong man who beats down a weaker man. And it sounds kind of violent, but it's really not because the, the, the strong man is likened to our virtues. And the weaker is likened to our um, defilements. And it's basically recognizing that our virtues are stronger than our defilements. And we recognize the strength of our virtues and we act accordingly, not only physically acting, not only verbally acting, but also mentally acting according to our virtues, our aspirations, our values. So this whole process actually includes tremendous insight. It's not just about trying to get rid of thoughts so we can go get have a nice, quiet, silent, concentrated meditation, although that's a really nice benefit of it. It actually gives us insight into all kinds of dynamics of thought. But I want to stop blabbering on now because I want to hear some of your questions and respond to the concerns that you may have. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we do have a, a couple of questions that came in, one from Victoria, one from Susan, and they're um, very similar. So I'll kind of combine them into one. They're both both asking about thoughts that arise in their meditation that would fall into that neither wholesome nor unwholesome, the mundane thoughts, the planning, just the everyday stuff. And they're both saying that no matter how hard they've tried to work with those, they stand in the way of their samadhi, of their concentration. And uh, do you have any 
let's see, uh, Victoria actually uh, ends her question with, how can I learn to rest my mind? Where do we find the purity of our wisdom? Yeah. Um, you know, they, they may not, um, like planning, you know, we have to be able to plan. Effective planners are, I mean, you can't accomplish anything without being able to plan for it. We certainly couldn't meet here without planning for it. But um, um, but it's still not very useful. And restlessness is definitely an obstruction to concentration, to peace, to relaxation, and to the capacity to see things clearly. So um, when we can sense the uh, like the reflection on what is the danger in it, um, restlessness to me and planning, obsessive planning, you know, there's a lot of danger in it. it keeps us out of the present. It keeps us disconnected from what's real. It prevents concentration. It it prevents the mind. And and you're already the question implies that you're already recognizing those dangers. And there are times when we can. Though they might seem like they're not terribly evil thoughts, they're not. They're also not totally neutral. Um, planning um, often, when you look at the thought of planning, look at the feeling underneath it. Planning very often has some sense of insecurity underneath it. There's some delusion that refuses to see that there's no self in control, or that 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 things that we can that 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 they're impermanent. So the 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 planning um, prevents us from seeing impermanence and not self. So it's actually a, a, a real strong kind of um, blinder. And when we sense that, we'll sense the more unwholesome quality of those restless minds. And that can build dispassion for it and the strength to really um, make a, a stronger resolve based on the wisdom that sees how it's preventing uh, the mind from settling. Um, very often, though, when the planning, we can see how it links up to a sense of of of. Um, non-ease with change <laughs> or um, a sense of I want to be in control, that sense of I. Mm -hmm. uh, but nevertheless, it's a very common strategy. Um, I, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, um, a well-practiced planner. <laughs> That's the tendency that my mind likes to go to. I rarely go to the past. This mind just likes to conceive of the future. So I've had to unpack again and again the subtle insecurity, the not wanting to see impermanence, the not, the not wanting to recognize the lack of control that we really have, the inevitability of death. Um, and to so so death reflections can be helpful as replacements. Um, I, I mean, I I, I have a, um, a a cousin who was just in the storm in California just last week was driving and a tree fell on on his car as he was driving. Um, he didn't die, but it was really a well. Well, this certainly could have. He just had to sit in the car and for hours until the until he could be rescued. <laughs> Um, it was a bad storm. I guess you've probably all heard we had. So um, when, when a tree falls on your car, you know, you really realize, you know, you don't have control. You really don't have control. And are we OK with that? So I would suggest planning to still work with these five strategies. You might work with them a little gently because they're not really harsh um, hindrances. Um, but I would put restlessness and planning squarely in the not helpful and the um, and the unwholesome category. But I would do so only after I had already planned it three times. <laughs> I give myself three plans. But I, I don't keep planning and then keep planning and then keep planning and then keep planning, you know, and when it goes on and on, then it's it's really clearly an obsession more than a plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I was going through your book and we have another question that just came up that kind of pings on this a little bit. It made me think that um, over the time that I've been meditating, you know, 20 some years that increasingly as concentration gets stronger and the reward of a concentrated mind becomes more visceral and knowable, mm -hmm. 
that in and of itself is fuel for letting go of thoughts. And so I'm wondering for like the beginning meditator, and I'm, I'm certainly not the, at the end of this road yet either. Um, but how the question came up when I was speaking to someone else, a student, um, over this past week when I was reading the book that said, it just seems like there's coming back to what at the, okay. Okay. Like what's the, what's the goal here? And so for a student who's experienced the jhana states or, uh, and this is a question that specific Robin says, are these five ways of focusing the mind, especially useful in achieving access concentration to enter the jhanas. And so I would, I'm, sure you, you would can talk to that, but it just made me kind of feel for my beginning meditator self at, before the concentration was deep enough to really access some of the reward of being present of the stiller mind. I think this is an important, um, this is an important point. And the language of reward, reward is really important because most of our habits continue because we have, um, confused ourselves and we think we're getting a reward that we're not actually getting. Um, the Buddha suggested that we recognize not only the danger in things, but also the gratification. What do we think we're getting out of it? And most of our unwholesome patterns, anything that's repeated repeats because we think we're getting something out of it. Planning repeats because we think we're able to control the future. But if we step back and look at that, we realize that's total delusion. So we're actually only reinforcing delusion, but we think we're able to control or we feel like somehow we're able to control the future. So we're getting a, a, a false reward. Um, sometimes we're getting sensual pleasure um, produces you know, pleasure. And we think that that is um, that is a, a useful reward, but it, uh, it it's usually based upon very impermanent conditions, and then it produces more craving. So the danger is greater than the reward, but we often just focus on that false reward. So we need to reevaluate what the reward is. And I love that you're describing the pleasure and the joy and the peace and the uh, the benefits that come from a quiet, calm mind. There are great benefits that come from concentration with or without jhana. Jhana is deep and unmistakable pleasures and, and rewards and stability, not just pleasure, but stability of mind, uh, efficiency of mind, clarity of mind. Um, but any kind of concentration and stilling can be can be helpful. Uh, but it, the rewards go far beyond concentration. They help us to, as the mind gets more stable, we could say concentrated, that enables us to see things more clearly. And we can help free ourselves from so many of the, the delusions that just keep us stuck in the same old habit, the same old pattern again and again. Um, I do think when we, we should ask ourselves, periodically, or even reflect at the beginning of each meditation, what is our purpose? Why do we do this? What do we want? And I like to have a big overarching reason, you know, like awakening, <laughs> ending greed, hate, and delusion, freeing the mind from the causes of suffering. Now, I may not fully accomplish that in the, in the next, you know, 50 minute meditation session, <laughs> but, um, but maybe, but anyway, there's an overarching purpose. And then there can also be an altruistic motivation. May this practice be for the benefit, uh, bring peace to myself and others, or may this practice be of benefit to all beings. And then I like to have a third objective, which is something like how I'm going to focus that meditation. You know, may I, um, uh, may I uh, be mindful of this moment free of self-judgment? Or may I be mindful and observe the antics of the mind? Um, may I, I uh, try to remember these five strategies and apply them? <laughs> something, <laughs> you know, something. And I think this uh, gently but regularly reflecting upon our aim helps us find the benefit that is inclined 
towards our greatest aims rather than the temporary pleasures that come by repeating familiar habits. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question this morning in the class that I was teaching that I said, if we had a chance that I would ask you, um, which was a student mentioned that she has, um, she feels like she has a very strong sort of moral code about behavior herself and others. And that she struggles to, um, to work these five steps into what it takes for her to draw boundaries around usually other people's behavior, like what is acceptable and not acceptable, how those could be judged. When are they judging thoughts that are unwholesome? And when are, when is it just a healthy way of discernment and in uh, doing an investigation on what are healthy boundaries for her? So I think you mentioned boundaries uh, in the book somewhere. Um, and I, I said, I would pose this because I think a lot of people might have a similar type of question around when did, does our thinking cross the line into unwholesome from just trying to stay in alignment with what we perceive to be our beliefs, yeah. values? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, the Buddha suggested that, that, that the, for example, the people that we interact with affect us. So he suggested that we not, if we want to get concentrated, that we don't hang out with distracted people. We hang out with people who value concentration. And if we want to uh, practice virtue, that we don't hang out with people who are um, unvirtuous. We, 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 we look for good friends who share our, um, our commitment to virtue. So in a way, it sounds like we should um, hang out with those people who are like us. Um, but I don't think that we should take this so strictly that we that we only, you know, only know people who share all of our views, who, you know, walk in our in our, in our shoes in many different aspects, who who vote like us, who who share the same politics, who share the same um, religion, who share the same background, who share the same race, who share the same culture. I, I think that's um, way too close minded, actually. Um, so we can recognize that we are, um, you know, we we live in a much more diverse kind of society where there are people who are very virtuous and there are people who are extremely unvirtuous. And we can know right from wrong without letting the mind go into anger and hate. Mm. And so we can clearly make boundaries um, in the sense of knowing what's wholesome and unwholesome, right from wrong. Um, but that's that doesn't mean that the mind goes into a lot of judgment that leads to stories of anger and hate. And I think that's where a boundary can, can be put. Very clear very clear discernment without the judgment that makes self seem virtuous in contrast to the other as being um, wrong. Mm -hmm. So anything that that reinforces views and opinions is very likely a problem. Um, anything that creates a self and uh, 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 a um, you know, a, a self righteousness compared to judgment of others, or sometimes it's self judgment. I'm so horrible, and they're so great. <laughs> uh, that usually doesn't. Well, in any case, it it can go the other way. But those are the problems, and where we set the boundary in our mind, I believe, should be around the proliferating of stories that reinforce anger or hate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Paul asks a, a question that may be slightly related. Um, he asks, might discerning wholesome from unwholesome thoughts accentuate the judging mind? Might it encourage us to get down on ourselves or to congratulate ourselves? Um, we have to do so in the context of, of, of wisdom and right view and understanding. Um, so um, one of the most basic descriptions of, of of panya which is usually translated from pali uh, panya is the pali term for wisdom or discernment is to basically discern the wholesome from the unwholesome 
We have to discern if this is rooted in defilement or if this is rooted in wholesome qualities like compassion and joy or compassion and, and um, you know, wisdom. So, so we need to recognize it. And we recognize it by looking often just at our own mind states. We get to know what is the quality of mind that is angry? What is the quality of mind that is greedy? What is the quality of mind that is arrogant? And we also get to know what is the quality of mind that sees impermanence? What is the quality of mind that is uh, equanimous and concentrated and calm? What is the quality of mind that is generous? And through recognizing the experience of those states, we recognize, um, you know, that they're wholesome or unwholesome based upon their roots within our own mind. Now, it's another step to say what is suitable or unsuitable in a particular situation. For example, a quality of generosity can be beautiful in our minds, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in every situation we should give away everything that we have. <laughs> <laughs> so um so uh, how we act on those is another level of dis uh, that we have to discern uh, but but to recognize that that we're recognizing those those qualities and and those qualities of mind that arise in a, in a, in a state of anger are not mine their mental factors, their their feelings, their their mental quality, their mental qualities, their states of mind, they're um, they're shared by all people, you know, who get angry. <laughs> so um, it's it's not like I am a bad person. It's that this state is leading to is is rooted in anger and leads to to cruelty. Um, the same with um, with all the different states. We get to know those states, but we don't need to to attribute them to be who I am or I'm this kind of person. That's all a solidified view that comes on top of it. Um, so, uh, but but it's not uncommon, especially as people begin their um, the unraveling and exploration of their own minds, to start from the perspective that this is this is how I am. This is my pattern, and so we just do this investigation gently until we start to see. You know, it's not that I am angry; it's that anger arose. And let me look at this this state of anger as anger. And then when we understand the anger as we're experiencing it, we're going to understand anger in other people too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. One one last question uh, a couple people have asked, actually. Um, one person says, I can see needing ongoing guidance along with the book, which is great, by the way. Can you recommend some place online where this is practiced or some form of training that can wh where this person can go? How do we learn more about this? Well, how, how do you practice this? I'm going to take this as an invitation for self-promotion. <laughs> And um, I, I would say go to my website, shylacatherine.com. And you'll say that these days I'm doing a lot of online teaching. And although I'm based in California, um, most of the events are timed so that they might be a little bit later on the East Coast, but 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 very doable. Mm -hmm. um, so I have um, weekend retreats. I also teach residential retreats where I go very deep into this subject um, and work also with jhana practices. Um, I teach some retreats based upon jhana practices, some retreats based upon uh, beyond this, beyond distraction, working with thought, some retreats that are based on mindfulness of death. That's a current interest of mine and some on developing the jhana factors through the practices of loving kindness and the Brahma Viharas. Mm -hmm. And so I have certain themes of retreats and then I teach some retreats that are general concentration and insight, sort of general mindfulness and Dharma retreats. So it would be um, lovely to just see you at a retreat, whether it's online or um, or in person. And I also have online classes. I do two online classes through Bodhi courses. And that's uh, the website is bodhicourses.org. And um and those are um um and those are on different subjects. I do have 
one course. We just finished it in December, though. I did it this fall and one course right on this that used this book and worked through for three months really carefully with a lot of resources, got tons of guided meditations, lots of, of supplementary teachings. We, you know, regular uh, meetings on Zoom to work with all of these strategies. Um, but I think I'm gonna gonna hold it off a year and um, not offer it again until maybe 2024. Mm-hmm. I have some other subjects I like to teach. Um, Wisdom Publications did just film a short course on this subject, and that'll be available this spring. So you should see a, a short one. It's much shorter than the Bodhi Courses one, um, but it will give you an it'll give you an, an, a brief overview. Hmm. Great. So there, there are different resources. And um, and um, I also think what's great fun is is to get some Dharma friends together. I, I know a number of groups that say, oh, I'm going to just get people in my Sangha and ask, does anybody want to read this together and get 10 people for a mini book club and just work through it. Um, and if you do do that, my recommendation is please do the exercises in the boxes. I love the exercises in the boxes and um, discuss how you experience the daily life practices, because I do feel like if we want to deepen our meditation practice, sure, a lot happens in the way that we meditate and the skills we bring to meditation, but a lot more happens in the other 23 hours of the day. Well, well, some of those are asleep, but whatever other hours of the day, you're not asleep. And I think watching the mind when we're cooking, when we're speaking to people, when we're working, um, checking in with our minds regularly throughout the day, noting what our habitual patterns are throughout the day, especially when you wake up in the morning and maybe go brush your teeth or take you to take a shower. What are the first thoughts in the first 10 minutes of the day before you've really established strong mindfulness, you know, and um, notice what those thoughts are. You'll get a very clear sense. If you look at the mind early in the day, what your patterns are, and then you can write them down and you can develop a strategy strategies for working with them. I'm glad you mentioned the exercises in the boxes and the everyday implementation of some of these of these five tools because it's yeah it they're they're really great thank you yeah they're they're fun actually they're really fun to do and you don't have to make a big like project of all of it but it's a fun it's it's fun to have a little project sometimes yeah (laughs) especially a dharma project yes all right we have i know we could spend another hour with you but we are coming to our close so i just want to thank you so much would you like to lead us in a closing dedication of merit for our time together today sure well let's just take a moment to take a few breaths and actually be present for your own breath aware that we're each sitting in our own spaces together. So we're both alone and in community. And having a sense of appreciation for our own practice and the practice of community. We each have our struggles and our joys. May whatever benefits or merits come through sharing these teachings, may it be a support for your liberating practice. Be well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.